please introduce our speaker. Okay. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Moran, an Associate Professor of Medicine from Columbia University, and who serves as the Director of Global Hypertension Control at Resolve to Save Lives. Dr. Moran received his MD and MPH from Columbia University. He, he completed a residency in internal medicine at Columbia University Medical Center and a fellowship in general internal medicine at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Brand's chief interests are in hypertension control and cardiovascular disease prevention with a particular focus on prevention in low and middle income countries. At Columbia University, Dr. Moran leads uh, predictive modeling and economic analyses of major clinical trials, including the landmark sprint trial of intensive blood pressure treatment and the Los Angeles Barber Pharmacist Blood Pressure Lowering Trial. He serves on the Hypertension Guideline Development Group at the World Health Organization and on the board of the World Hypertension League. He is also leading research projects related to national cardiovascular disease prevention policies, including early prevention in young adults and the optimal approach to screening and treatment of familial hypercholesterolemia. Dr. Brand will be leading a discussion today on the topic of value of early lipid lowering treatment and to prevent later life cardiovascular disease. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Moran. Thank you so much for that introduction. That saves me having to describe my first slide, but I just wanted to um, you know, thank everyone for, for um, coming today for this uh, Grand Rounds talk. And I'm really excited to present and it's sort of a, showing a, a scientific journey of discovery and um, hope, uh, hope it resonates with, with your own experiences. So for today's talk, I'm going to introduce myself and my research team here at Columbia. I'm going to give an overview of a completed study we call it the Young Adult Study and then talk about some of the subsequent work that led um, uh, uh, resulted from that, uh, the familial hypercholesterolemia screening in children study. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose related to today's talk or in general. So, so first, this slide is um, a career journey slide. Um, just to introduce you to myself, um, I did start after college um, spent a few years as an artist and then working at various jobs to support that habit. Um, and so it was a time of a lot of exploration. Uh, eventually, I had a, a crisis of utility. I wanted to do something good and measurable in the world. Um, though art does do that, I thought um, medicine would also do that. So I um, took my pre-med courses, went to um, medical school at Columbia, but um, a number of years after graduating from college. And then it was during during medical school that um, I started to get interested in doing research. And so um, even starting in medical school, I, I was able to take a year off, get a master's degree, and actually complete a, a research clinical research study in people with diabetes with the American Diabetes Association grant. And that kind of, I caught the bug just then. And so kept doing that. And then uh, more recently, um, starting in 2019, I joined Resolve to Save Lives, as you've heard. And uh, there I've been learning about public health program implementation, but really hypertension control program implementation. So it really rounded out my skill set. And it's made life really interesting to have these different components of uh, clinical medicine, uh, research, and public health work. So just to introduce uh, my team, so I personally have a background in general internal medicine and primary care, cardiovascular disease prevention research. But the research team here, we bring together a lot of different skills and different disciplines, clinical medicine, epidemiology, decision analysis, and health economics. And our research themes, as you heard, uh, evaluate, planning and evaluating hypertension control programs and assessing the value of early cardiovascular disease prevention so it's really that, that second uh, topic that we're going to focus on in today's talk. So starting with the young adult study, uh, just by way of background, this is a, a pyramid showing the traditional hierarchy of, of medical evidence. And as we know, uh, uh, clinical uh, randomized controlled trials are, are sort of at the top of the pyramid. They have a couple of summary um, types of studies of trials on top of that. But but really, um, we, we really go to the randomized control trials for the most reliable evidence for, for good reason. And then below that, we have observational studies um, and, um, and then below that case reports and expert opinion. So um, recognizing that this, this hierarchy does make a lot of sense, but there are limitations to traditional randomized outcome trials. 
for one thing, they're expensive. Um, and will there be another sprint or an all hat in the cardiovascular disease space? Um, not in the near term, doesn't look likely. Um, these trials are typically three to five years in duration, partly due to expense. Um, and they may not rely uh, align with patient or payer values, which are more focused on gaining a longer, healthier life. And it's challenging to study treatment effects in young people using a traditional trial setup or let alone in uh, pediatric patients. The other thing about trials is that um, often they, they select a uh, short-term high-risk group so that there are enough events and enough power for the to show a difference in the study. There can be selection bias. And often, um, again, for power statistical reasons, uh, it's often uh, combined outcomes are, are used and sometimes those are hard to interpret and apply to our clinical practice. So there's just a, some limitations. Um, and, and I mentioned the long-term perspective, but there, there are uh, studies looking at the long-term effects of clinical trial interventions. And there's a list here on the slide from the cardiovascular space. Uh, there, there was long-term follow-up of the SHEP trial, which was a trial of hypertension treatment or isolated systolic hypertension treatment. And then two of the, the landmark uh, prevention trials for um, lipid lowering therapy with statins they also had the ability to follow up these trial cohorts long-term. And it's really these kind of studies looking at long-term follow-up of people participating in clinical trials that gives us the concept of a legacy effect. Meaning even though the, the intervention was relatively short-term, there's a legacy years and years later in terms of who received the intervention versus who didn't. It's true for statins, it's true for bisphosphonates, and that, that really affects um, our decisions and, and how long we keep people treated on medicines. So go, going to my perspective and, and working in the health economic evaluation area, we really, we do take a long-term perspective. And a lot of the way we do things uh, adopts this perspective is because it's really um, from a societal and health system point of view, what, what really is important to know. Um, so often we, uh, as outcomes with the total costs, with total health gained, um, and we uh, look at um, outcomes such as quality adjusted year, uh, life years or just life years. And these are really um, often using a lifetime horizon. So um, you can see um, you know, what, what is the uh, impact on someone's health over the lifetime. Now, um, having said that in the US context, that lifetime perspective is really the best if you're a, if you're a single payer, uh, like in the United Kingdom or in Denmark or someplace like that, where um, the health system is responsible for the citizens' health from birth to death. And we have the private, you know, private health insurance up to um, uh, older, older age and, and some people, government insurance and some people for their whole life. So it's a mix. And often you have to tailor these analyses to fit with what, which payer you're trying to speak to. Now, um, last slide here on looking at long-term evidence. And this is gonna come up later in, in some of the, the, um, the young adult study. So there's this uh, observational method, uh, observational study method called Mendelian randomization. And basically um, it uses that random assortment of uh, genes uh, uh, at conception to, to um, basically randomize people based on that, their genotype status. And so this is um, pertinent to the talk because we have a comparison here of effect sizes related to people having um, PCSK9 a loss of function uh, mutations versus the effect of a statin treatment trial. And you can see if you look, um, it's a dose response effect. And if you look down the, the figure, um, there's um, a diminishing dose of, um, of LDL cholesterol lowering, but in in the the dark blue squares, you can see the effect of a lifetime um, genetic effect of lifetime lower LDL cholesterol versus a later life treatment with statin, statin. And you can see that the duration of lipid lowering has a big effect. And that's really what we see when we compare that lifelong lowering of genetically determined low LDL versus statin treatment. So keep this slide in mind for later. So the rationale of the young adult study, uh, this is an NHLBI funded study. And the premise was that cumulative risk factor exposure starting in childhood or young adulthood contribute to the evolution of atherosclerosis in later life 
atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And you can think of those concepts or you're, you're more familiar with the concept of tobacco pack years. And this is a, a same, the same concept in terms of cumulative exposure in terms of short-term exposure. So most clinical trials last about five years. They enroll older, high-risk adults. Cumulative risk factor exposures are often not accounted for in treatment guidelines or in risk prediction equations. And we, we aim to use mathematical, mathematical models to translate observational evidence into simulated long-term treatment trials. The aims were to first estimate potential life years gain from blood pressure and LDL cholesterol control during young adulthood or early prevention accounting for cumulative atherosclerotic damage from young adult exposures and project life years gained and cost effectiveness of early treatment. So the first aim, we're gonna look at some um, epidemiologic evidence looking at the uh, independent contribution of young adult LDL cholesterol and other risk factor exposures on later life ASCVD risk. To do this, we pooled a number of observational cohorts that are uh, funded by the US NIH. You can see the list here. And um, the total number of unique individuals we pooled was 30, a little bit over 36,000. And this slide is really important for describing how and why we, we pooled these cohorts, especially the panel on the left, which shows the age distribution or the, the, the years of observation, the ages of observation for the different studies, you can see that there's only one study, the Framingham Offspring Study, that recruited people in their um, young adult or even adolescent years and followed them through to the end of their life. Now, um, the other cohorts were more limited, but they do cover a good portion of the lifespan. For example, the Cardia Study which is just listed just below Framingham offspring, was dedicated to studying young adult um, cardiovascular health versus some other studies like the cardiovas cardiovascular health study or CHS was dedicated to studying cardiovascular health in older adults. So what we're able to do is pool all of these data sets together. And with that, we're able to estimate lifetime trajectories in every individual in this pool cohort. Now, if you, um, so in terms of this is a, a paper in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, where we describe these, these results, but you can see on the left panel, there's some descriptions of our cohort I mentioned before. You can see the number of events that were counted up during the observation periods of these trials. But more importantly, if you look at the, um, the, the plot at the, the bottom left, this is, this is a plot for one individual uh, who um, provided data for this pool cohorts data set. The orange dots are the actual observed LDL cholesterol for this person as they came back for study visits. And then you can see some lines that are drawn. The, the solid line is the imputed LDL cholesterol trajectory that we, we uh, fitted for this person. And you can see that we fitted some numbers that are younger than this person was observed. And we were able to do that by borrowing strength from the other cohort studies that had observations at younger ages. And so this was um, uh, uh, a st st statistical model that allowed us to fit trajectories for everyone by borrowing strength across the different um, ages that were observed. We also had something else. If you look at the dashed lines, the, um, the, the dashed line on the left is the time-weighted average LDL cholesterol during the young adult years, you can see it rises as it accumulates, but this is one of our variables that's in the prediction model, the young adult uh, time-weighted average. And then we have the later lifetime weighted average, which counts up the LDL cholesterol starting after age 40. So with that in mind, uh, you can see that we had these prediction models and estimated hazard ratios related to that time-weighted average or cumulative exposure to LDL cholesterol and high blood pressure um, as predictors of later life cardiovascular disease with their current or their most recently measured risk factor number in the same model. So this is the independent effect of that cumulative exposure over time, sort of like the tobacco pack years that we mentioned earlier. And what we saw is um, we saw some associations with higher blood pressure levels, um, cumulative blood pressure levels, and cumulative LDL cholesterol levels 
But really it was, um, what popped out was this finding with the association between higher LDL cholesterol exposure during the young adult years and the risk for coronary heart disease. And again, this is above and beyond their later life or their, their middle age cholesterol. So, um, so we found the signal and this is really what led to everything else that we did. And again, this is another slide just reiterating this focus on the LDL cholesterol during a young adulthood. Um, it was associated with a, um, comparing low versus high, the higher cumulative exposure was associated with a 64% increased list, risk for coronary heart disease, independent of later life adult exposures. So as I said, we didn't stop there. We're not just epidemiologists. We, we wanted to try to translate this into what it would look like in, um, if we were to introduce earlier uh, treatment of cholesterol, what would be the, the um, incremental gain in health. And so we took this, um, the, 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 the data from the observational cohort studies and we translated into a simulation model. And so this is a, what's called a micro simulation model. It, it simulates individuals for their lifetime and it includes um, uh, people who are selected from the US and Haines. And um, it uh, simulates them from age 18 until death or age 89. And it also counts up incidence of coronary heart disease, stroke, and non-cardiovascular disease mortality. And these are all uh, these are all predicted by risk functions that are predicted that are estimated from that pool cohorts data set. So, what went into this mathematical model? So, again, we had um, individual person at level simulations. They came. Uh, we we um, we derived this simulation cohort from the US National Survey, the NHANES, people without existing cardiovascular disease. And these are the, an example of the prediction equation you can see here, but if you look at um, anything in that equation that says TWA, it's basically the time-weighted average or cumulative exposure to that risk factor along with the, the current value um, for the person um, when they're being simulated. And this will give you a, a, this is a conceptual uh, diagram showing how, um, how the model works. And if you look at the left panel, we're looking at someone's lifetime, basically from age 20 till uh, 65. And this is a person with left untreated, they're starting with a quite high LDL cholesterol, 175 at age 20. And that, that just continues at that high level if you leave it untreated. Now in the current paradigm, usually you'll screen this person most people don't get screened when they're a young adult or even childhood. Um, they'll come into their general internist office. They'll get screened around age 40. The, um, there'll be a calculation with the um, pool cohorts equation. And then probably you put this person on a statin. So that's where that green line, you lower their cholesterol and they stay at the low cholesterol if they stay on their medicine. And then the, the, the third scenario is where we screen and identify and treat this person during young adulthood and that's that purple line. So if you look on the right panel, you can see what results from these different scenarios. In the no treatment scenarios, you see the, the blue bar um, uh, representing the number of ASCD events over the lifetime for that group. And then we have the later life treatment. You can see there's a benefit and there's a rise in the um, ASCVD free years with uh, treatment during at midlife. And then you see the um, the relative improvement in lowering ASCVD events if you treat in young adulthood and a rise in uh, average ASCVD free years. So this is this is the conceptual diagram. Hopefully you're you're getting it by now. Um, and so so what we did was um, to formalize this. We put it uh, some different strategies that are based on current U.S. practice and some hypothetical uh, examples of what could be strategies that could be done in comparison with the current standard of care. So standard of care you see there, you'll, it's familiar to you based on the 2018 ACC AHA lipid guideline. Um, and then we looked at some statin strategies, treating people at different levels of high LDL cholesterol. And then we also looked at some lifestyle modification strategies that were based on a review by the US Preventive Services Task Force in terms of uh, primary counsel care counseling for um, lifestyle change. 
And just to make sure we were what we were doing was not too um, way out there and, and had some validity, we, we went through some validation exercises. So we ensured that these predictions of this model over time that they matched up well with US uh, cohort incidence rates and also with national life tables, which they did. And then we did this benchmarking exercise to look at effect sizes using observed effects of a um, DCSK9 loss of function mutation that gives people, as you saw in the prior slide, this is a mutation that gives people lifelong low LDL cholesterol. PCSK9, um, it, it, it eats up all the LDL receptors in, in circulation. And so if it's not working, there are lots of LDL uh, receptors out there and they're pulling uh, the LDL cholesterol into the um, hepatic cells for, um, and out of the bloodstream. So, um, so in terms of this benchmarking exercise, you can see there's a base case with untreated LDL cholesterol, that's our reference. And then um, we had two simulations. We had uh, moderate intensity statins during at age 18. And at the very, uh, um, the bottom row, we have the simulation of treating at midlife at age 40, sort of like you saw in that conceptual diagram. And not surprisingly, um, the uh, young adult uh, treatment had a um, more favorable reduction and CHD risk. And by in the benchmarking exercise, you can see that the result of that lifelong um, low cholesterol from PCSK9 loss of function, it has a ratio of 0.78. So this kind of reassured us that our estimate for young adults was somewhere between midlife treatment and lifelong low LDL cholesterol. So um, we don't know if our number is precisely right, but it does, it does fit as um, being biologically plausible. And so here are the results. Um, if you're not familiar with cost-effectiveness analysis and the way the results are reported, what this figure shows you, it's a cost-effectiveness plane. You have rising costs on the y-axis, and then you have increased health or life year gain on the x-axis. So um, the, the really uh, affordable and um, positive impact interventions, they're gonna stay low on the y-axis and move very far out to the right on the x-axis, health gains at a low cost. So you can see um, this, this plot is looking at results for young adult women. And for both uh, treating young adult women with LDL cholesterol 160 and above or 130 and above, if you're using generic statins, it's intermediately cost effective, um, not super affordable, not below uh, 50,000 US dollars per quality gain, which is the kind of, has been an enduring standard of cost effectiveness, even with inflation. Um, and, um, but, but one thing to note is that compared um, with lifestyle treatment strategies, those were dominated by um, statin treatment. Now, here's the plot. Uh, you have to think back what you saw in the last slide, but as you can see the statin treat treatment in young adult men was much more favorably uh, favorable from a, this cost effectiveness um, perspective. You can see that um, strategy B, which is LDL cholesterol 160 treatment and strategy D, which is uh, greater than 130 treatment, these are highly cost effective because the costs are kept low, low on the Y axis and a lot of health gains off to the right on the X axis. Again, lifestyle treatment strategies were dominated. And it's important that all these results with these great cost effectiveness ratios are based on generic statin prices. There are prices out there um, of statins that, that um, if you use those and those prices, it would no longer be quite as favorable. So in conclusion for the young adult study, we found that, um, I didn't show this, but uh, uh, less than 50% of young adults are screened for high DL LDL cholesterol currently. Um, the numbers are even lower in children. You'll see that, I won't show that, but that, we'll talk about that later. Um, lacking clinical trial evidence, we simulated decades long trials and a feasible approach to estimating the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of long-term statin treatment in young adults with quite high LDL cholesterol. Based on the results, um, we have the most confidence in recommending early statin treatment for young adult men with LDL cholesterol greater than equal to 160. 
So um, in the US, initiating statin treatment in young adult men was, with raised LDL cholesterol was highly cost effective at generic prices. Now, there is a, a caveat here that we, we found that lifestyle interventions focused on individual behavior change were not cost effective, but we did not study public health LDL cholesterol lowering programs that have been successful in improving L uh, CBD health at low cost. And one example is the North Karelia study from Finland. So um, that is the results. Uh, those are the results of the young adult study. But we, we didn't stop there. We kept going. And um, this is a slide looking at um, just some statements from uh, an editorial that my colleagues and I who are working on this next study uh, wrote uh, to the, for the JAMA, along with the recent U.S. Preventive Services Task Force statement related to childhood cholesterol screening. And what we wrote, they basically, childhood uh, lipid screening got an I statement, which means insufficient evidence. If you look at the, the media reporting around this statement, you would think that they recommended flatly against any kind of screening, but really what they found was there's insufficient evidence and no decision can clearly be taken without evidence. So, um, so what we wrote in our editorial, the current I statement pushes the possibility of systematic national childhood lipid screening program into the future. However, we believe that evidence supporting specific screening for and treatment of familial hypercholesterolemia in childhood is growing and a universal screening approach to reduce the burden of premature ASCVD among persons with FH will likely be adopted in the future. And so that's this current study that we're still working on, which is uh, familial hypercholesterolemia screening in children. We took our, uh, so I, I didn't talk much about FH, but it's, it's basically, it's among three of the most common and consequential genetically determined conditions, along with the BRCA mutation for breast cancer and Lynch syndrome. Uh, and the CDC has designated these as tier one genetic conditions. So they're common and they have, um, uh, they're really severe in their impact on individuals. So they, they're, they're in the category you might consider um, screening on a massive scale for, for these types of conditions. So, so um, what we did in this study is we took our adult pool cohorts data set that I showed you already, and then we added data from this International Childhood Cohort Collaborative, which had um, uh, childhood cohorts. And so we're able to stretch basically the entire, across the entire life course in terms of observations right. from years five to old age. We also, for this second study, uh, linked with the top med genotype data to allow us to describe and quantify intervention, indiv independent contribution of familial hypercholesterolemia genotype in addition to LDL cholesterol level in ASCVD risk assessment. And then again, we translated these, we, we are translating these results, results into simulation decision analysis uh, about FH screening strategies in the US population. As you can tell from the title of this study, we were looking at, um, and you'll see later on, but a lot of it was focused on earlier screening in childhood uh, to detect FH because a lot of people, if they're left untreated during their childhood or young adult years, they will have an MI when they're in their 30s or in their 40s. So waiting to screen somebody um, with, <laughs> to identify FH in the 40s, um, you may, it may be too late. And there's also the opportunity uh, when you screen someone positive to do cascade screening, to look uh, if they have, especially if they are genotype positive, to find others in their family um, who might be at risk. So we, again, we started with some epidemiologic analyses, this time using that data set that goes from age five until old age. And um, we looked at, these are called violin plots, this plot here in the, uh, the lower right. And you can see on the, the y-axis is LDL cholesterol level, on the x-axis are different age ranges. And uh, we looked at um, the distribution of LDL cholesterol in each of these age categories. And as you can see, not surprisingly, um, as people age, the distribution of LDL cholesterol goes higher. And so um, using the same uh, LDL cholesterol threshold number for all ages doesn't make sense. So in this paper, really identifying what should be the childhood thresholds for um, selecting the, the top uh, 95th or 99th percentile of the distribution, 
where we think we might find those FH patients um, in the second pass of screening. And um, I, I have a big arrow here to remind me to say, if you're not a pediatrician or um, working with young adults, you may not know that it's useless to screen people for their cholesterol when they're adolescents because the surges of sex hormones during adolescence lowers LDL cholesterol systematically and you really can't predict well what a person's LDL cholesterol was during childhood or will be during uh, adulthood at that age. Um, it's important to note also that it may look very, very tidy here in terms of, oh, you just, you just, you don't need the genotype, you just look at the LDL level. But in fact, um, we found in tracking analyses that there's a lot of movement um, from high to low cholesterol um, between um, the childhood and um, young adulthood and, and uh, mid age. So having a very high cholesterol and in childhood, if it's super duper high, like over 200 milligrams per deciliter, you probably have FH and you're gonna stay there. But if your number is 160, 130, there's a good chance that you're gonna regress lower or um, rise up higher with time. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, to mention is that environment factors related to physical activity and diet definitely start to play more and more of a role. And that's part of why the, there's that universal rise in uh, LDL over time. Okay. Another of our epidemiologic analyses, and this is just another take home message about what, what the consequences are of genetically determined high cholesterol. So if you look at the, the panel on the left, we're looking in our cohort data. And what we did was we matched people um, at age 60 for the same LDL cholesterol. And then we plotted those with the FH mutation, one of the FH mutations versus those without the FH mutation. And you can see this is, illustrates what you saw in that plot showing that lifetime exposure difference. Again, and this is lifetime high LDL cholesterol that even when you match people in mid-age for the same LDL cholesterol, the people with those mutations, they're just gonna have much higher lifetime exposure. And that's what that red curve shows you um, versus the blue curve and the people without the FH mutation. And this plays into the results we see with our um, Cox proportional hazards model on the right. And you can see there's a, a dose response here. There's a difference of course, between people with very high versus lower LDL cholesterol. That's this is 190 or and above versus lower than 190. Um, but there's also an added impact of having FH genotype positive. So um, if you look at the um, the highest risk for in the individuals who have the very high cholesterol along with FH mutation, that's a hazard ratio of 4.3 compared with the reference. Whereas if you look at the people without an FH mutation and very high cholesterol in the same range, their relative risk is 1.4. So clearly that FH genotype positive makes a big difference. And we think it's likely due to that lifetime higher exposure versus um, your current exposure. And we are in the middle of uh, doing our simulations of screening, but this is sort of a, to give you a conceptual diagram of kind of screening strategies we're going to compare and we're gonna compare them at different ages. But let's say if we're looking at a childhood screening um, algorithm, there's several different options. Um, we're gonna compare each strategy to people who are below the LDL th uh, threshold, which likely should be set younger and in, in kids, like we mentioned, based on those violin plots we saw earlier. But if you're above this LDL cholesterol threshold, what next? So you can either just say, okay, we're gonna call you having FH versus based on your phenotype alone. We could additionally add, uh, ask some information about family history of early atherosclerotic disease and early MI. And, um, and then based on that, decide who should be uh, uh, given the diagnosis. Or we could either do genotype after uh, LDL, or we could do genotype after LDL followed by family history. So these are some strategies we're going to look at and we expect there'll be different screening yields for each of these. And um, we also, for this project, we, we have a um, advisory panel that includes a parent of a child with familial hypercholesterolemia. We have pediatric, general pedi pediatricians, pediatric cardiologists, general internists, 
and they all bring very different perspectives, as you might imagine. Um, so it's really it's really good to um, have developed these strategies with this advisory panel, and we're going to share results with them and, and kind of talk to them about how to present the results and how to interpret the results. So next steps for this work, I am currently writing, uh, as, as we're finishing, I'm writing the renewal application for this. And for the renewal, what we're proposing are, is, uh, are to look at uh, the benefits, potential risks of novel lipid lowering therapies, things like PCSK9 inhibitors, but we're also going to do a hypothetical look at what what would be uh, what would society should would be or should be willing to pay for gene therapy to basically fix your FH mutation in childhood if you knew it that early. Um, so this is a very hypothetical um, aim. Then we aim two is is going to be um, led by my colleague Sarah De Ferranti, who's at Boston Children's. And they're going to do qualitative research to develop pediatric FH patient and family shared decision making algorithms around genetic testing and treatment options. And lastly, um, we're uh, we're going to do more uh, along the lines of a trial design for a health system based pediatric FH screening trial. And this is, I think, the last slide before we go into our discussion period. But I'm just showing you in terms of, um, for this AIM-3, we're, again, we're gonna have an advisory panel. We wanna recruit uh, people who are um, embedded in US health systems and um, either responsible for the, the cholesterol program or uh, screening programs and engage them. But how would you identify patients and families? Um, what, are the, what are the obstacles? How does the electronic health record fit in or not? Actually, very few kids get cholesterol checked. Maybe at Miami they do, but most places they don't. So EHR is maybe limited, but um, basically engaging uh, these, these um, panelists and um, the, the input on trial design. And we have a, a statistician who specializes in trial simulations and trial design. And we have an implementation scientist as well for making sure that we design a trial that includes implementation outcomes. And this, this last slide, just looking at some of the parameters that we'll look at as we, we uh, test different clinical trial designs. We'll look at, of course, we don't have adults screening here. That's not really the point of the study. That'll be the comparator. But we're looking at infant, um, childhood, and young adult ages, different thresholds for who gets screened in, at least in the first pass. What is the role of genetic testing? Should it come after LDL cholesterol? Should it come first before LDL cholesterol testing? And then the randomization arms, we think we'd have usual care, universal screening, family history, targeted screening, and then looking at the role of this nurse counseling um, along with um, doing the screening and sharing the results between their primary provider, what is, what is the utility and what's the benefit of having that additional counseling um, to inform the, the patient and the family about how to interpret the results and what are the options from there. And, um, just as a provocative, you know, going back to that U.S. Preventive Services Task Force statement and the editorial, um, we we felt like a lot of the, and, and this maybe will provoke some conversation today, but a lot of the the controversy and the discomfort was not so much about identifying a kid with sky high LDL cholesterol and a family history. Um, some people would argue about should they be treated with statins, should they treat with other medicines, but there's not that much controversy about that group. It's really about the kind of collateral implications of all these people. If you just do LDL cholesterol screening in everyone, you'll have a lot of kids with moderately high cholesterol, very high cholesterol, genotype negative. What do, what do you do? You, you might, I mean, the easy answer is lifestyle advice, but um, but there are a lot of questions there. And I think that's where the controversy and discomfort is. And that's the reason why we're kind of intrigued by this idea of genetic testing first. Um, you'd certainly miss some kids with high cholesterol, but um, you would know that you're starting with people who likely have li lifetime very high cholesterol. And you could also cascade to test family members and do other things. So the screening yield would be less, but there'd be less controversial um, less controversy and less questions about this group of people um, for whom we, we are not certain about what to do uh, with their management. So I'm going to stop there and acknowledge my, my research colleagues um, 
E.E. E. Chong and Brandon Bellows and Kieran Coley Lynch, who worked with me at Columbia, and Sarah De Ferranti, who's a pediatric cardiologist at Boston Children's. Thanks, Andrew, everybody. That was, thank you, Andrew. That was absolutely splendid. It was really exciting science, beautifully presented, understandably, and very didactic. Thank you. So maybe I can begin by uh, asking perhaps the first question. Um, so it seems to me that this cohort that you have, these samples that you have, are really primed. Yes, you are looking at individuals that have high LDL cholesterols and whether or not they have the genetic predisposition to develop later on uh, cardiovascular events. But it seems to me there's a population of individuals who have high LDLs that don't have the mutation. And the question is whether or not in that cohort, can you identify protective genes? In other words, it would be just as interesting to see what genes are responsible for causing the disease, but there may be some individuals who we would screen, and, and that would answer perhaps maybe the question of which comes first, the genetics or the phenotyping. And I just wondered if you had any insight into that. Yeah, we, we haven't included that in, in these uh, models, but there is, in fact, there, there was, you know, it's really nice when your collaborators spin off and publish research that you can claim in your, in your report to NIH. And there's actually, uh, there was a group that we, we work with this group of Mass General in Boston. They're the ones who help us identify who has the um, particular FH genotypes because we didn't know how to do that. Uh, and they published a paper about protective genes um, that that I could share with you. And we had to include that, but certainly that's that's of interest as as is the people with polygenetic causes or right. or yet to be identified causes of very high LDL cholesterol. So um, yeah, I, I agree. That would that would that's something we should look at and consider um, if, if we're doing the genotyping and could share that with the families and make a prediction based on that the balance between benefit and harm. Dr. Marcus, you had a question. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Yes. Um, my question was about Accutane, which is, you know, pretty, is, is relatively widespread in terms of use in young adults um, in their 20s and, and also just in, in teenagers. Um, and I'm wondering what the implications are for these findings. Um, usually the young person's on it for a couple of years. And I'm not familiar. You have to tell me what does that do to their cholesterol or? <laughs> oh, I'm it not, raises I, cholesterol you know, and it raises triglycerides okay. and LDL. Um, yeah. You know, pretty significant. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't data know on this. And we've got a lot of yeah. teenagers and the dermatologists just kind of yeah. don't really seem to think much of it, but uh, yeah. Well, that, that sounds like a great um, pharmacoepi study in the making. I mean, I think, um, you know, just, just a reminder that we, we always look at, um, you know, hypothyroidism, right? Or, you know, the, um, that also raises LDL cholesterol, but, but no one's ever shown that it has any impact on cardiovascular disease risk or anything significant. So, you know, I think you know, I, that's interesting. And, and I, I like how it's, um, this is focused on the same age group. So um, thank you for that observation. And I just want to say from the chat that, that Stephanie Brown mentioned that, you know, in terms of, I don't want to confuse anyone, in terms of the actual HCHA uh, recommendations, there is a recommendation to screen lipids at age 10 or 11 and repeat the screening at age 17, 18. Um, the, the, the problem is that very few people do it. And maybe in academic centers, it's more common. But I think in many, many pediatric practices, especially where they, they don't know, there's no genetic testing, they don't know what to do with the result. Um, so I think the studies have shown rates of cholesterol screening in kids, pediatric practices in the range of 10, 10 or 20% of kids getting screened. Now, like I said, in Miami, you may be doing 90%, but, <laughs> but I think in the national data, it, there, there's not a lot of uptake of this. This is this is why this kind of trial is really needed. Dr. Goldberg, please. Um, Dr. Moran, just outstanding. I'm a clinical lipidologist, and just this this even for me who works in this area to have this perspective just is so enriching. 
I, I have many questions and I don't want to take the rest of the time up. But but just from the standpoint of the data you you've modeled to suggest likely uh, cardiovascular outcome benefit from statin therapy started in an earlier age, and the and the the unlikelihood that clinical trials will ever enable us to answer the question: What kind of LDL uh, at what age would benefit in your quality adjusted life year from statin therapy? And so, um, I think it would be helpful to have some round numbers. If you've gone that far, uh, th that at any rate is what came to my mind. Certainly nobody would argue with not wanting to start statin therapy in kids with LDL levels more than 100, or at least young people, let's put it that way. There's some argument yeah. about how young, 10 years, many of us are starting to treat now. But taking a line from that, how would you answer that question? Well, I, it is actually controversial. Not everyone agrees with that. And I think there is reluctance to treat kids with a medicine, any medicine for that, that long of a time. Um, there, again, we don't have the trials. So what, what, you know, what does it do for your, your lifetime diabetes risk, for your hepatic function, things like that? Um, your, your muscle, you know, muscle mass. And it, there, there are a lot of questions. I don't want to brush it off. Um, and the other, I think the other interesting the thing that's come up in that dialogues with people who are working in this early prevention field is, uh, you know, the young adult years, it, it's, you know, we can talk about everyone should be on a statin or you should be taking a statin, but we don't even see, I mean, maybe in, in your um, med peds clinic or your, some of your clinics are, have, do a good job of keeping young adults in your practice, but, um, but many young adults don't see a doctor. Um, especially men, uh, and um, getting them to take a daily pill, that's non-trivial. I mean, I, I have young adults in my family, and <laughs> they're, not, they're not so keen to, you know, they don't take that long-term view. So, so, um, so it's challenging, and it almost, you know, I think it also makes this, this, this area interesting. It's like, how, what would we need to do to deliver healthcare to people in that age group? Because having them come into a clinic and the, the way we usually do things may not work. So another provocative question. And no. I think um, Dr. Uh, Tolentino has yes, hand raised. He's, he's our MedPeds program director. So he oh, has okay. he steps like Dr. Brown on both sides of the uh, aisle. Yes, hi, very nice to meet you. A wonderful talk. And this is actually an area that I talk multiple times with the residents about in clinic about this particular guideline um, because the American County of Pediatrics, as we mentioned before, recommends that we do um, screening lipids between 9 to 11. And what's interesting, and this is the part that is very hard for me to resolve, especially when I explain it to residents, is what they're actually screening for. And, and is it familial hypercholesterolemia, which has um, while it does have the cardiovascular risks, um, doesn't um, has a different set of uh, treatment value or, or uh, treatment plans as opposed to metabolic causes of hyperlipidemia. Um, and um, the AP recommendations and Future Bright Futures programs really focuses on the obesity epidemic and the metabolic causes of hypercholesterolemia. And I think there's some confusion as to why we're actually screening for this and how it's actually messaged to pediatricians and to and to us and and. And then it comes down to treatment and, you know, the risk associated with what does long-term statin use look like for the next 60 years? Are we going to, like you mentioned, yeah. diabetes and what have you. And I, uh, while, while I teach it, right, I tell my residents, you have to pass your peas board. So this is what we recommend. At the same time, there's lots of questions. And I think that's why sometimes you see the hesitancy amongst pediatricians or even med peace physicians. Um, because we, we, we don't know those long-term answers. And, um, and at the same time, we recognize that, um, screening for familial hypercholesterolemia isn't as clean, especially as we do see 30, 40% of, of teenagers coming through with obesity and is a familial hypercholesterolemia or not. Um, so mm -hmm. um, I guess my question um, at this to you is how do we make those, how do we distinguish those differences even now um, prior to, the, um, uh, uh, to looking at the study? And the second part is, is what do we do with this information um, do we send everybody to the cardio to our pediatric cardiologist or endocrinologist, 
or do we do lifestyle changes um, even even if we do see those risks of obesity? I think it's, it's much mm -hmm. more complex than I think a lot of people make it out to be. Yeah, I agree. I think you said it all. And I I, um, I mean, I said one, like one solution is to, to start with genotype first and then you could avoid some of this, um, but you'll miss, you'll miss opportunities that, you know, might give some clinical benefit for people. And I think that's, I mean, that's the tricky part about, if we're talking about, you know, the people where there's certainty, the very high cholesterol, the, the positive genotype, um, that's, I don't want to call it a no brainer, but it's, it's relatively easier, but um, that's, that's, you know, any, any trial design or any real, you know, if we actually, we want to do the real trial, I think Sarah will be the leader. She's the, she's the credible leader of the trial. But um, th this is where we're losing sleep is what do we do with all the, the kids you talked about where things are kind of in the gray zone and um, there's a lot of uncertainty and people don't know, clinicians don't know what to do. Families the, or, or young adults are not sure what they want. So um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. Andrew, taking... Process. Thank you, JT. T taking, um, seeing no other question, let me take the liberty of asking you yet another. So um, given that even small exposures to um, high lipid levels for brief periods of time may affect uh, later th things later in life, one has looked at hypertension and obesity in fetal environments and the maternal effect that even way back during um, at the time of conception or soon thereafter, there can be maternal influences that will affect the uh, eventual health and outcome of the adult. So how does one even begin to control for that since you're catching these kids, you know, when they're already 10 or 15 or whatever? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We're not, we're not controlling for it, certainly. And um, I know that's a, that's a very, a very important area of research. There's someone who used to be here at Columbia named Natalie Bello. She's now at Cedar Sinai, and um, she de she's developed a whole career around uh, you know um, blood pressure and, and pregnant women, pregnancy, and self monitoring, and um, so and and she's written on this too about you know what are the what are the consequences for the the, the child as well as for the mom. So um, we do we do not include that. <laughs> We include the entire life course, but not the family. And, um, but that, you know, it's, it's definitely important. We just haven't captured that, um, the, the, the value of that prevention um, earlier earlier on. Yeah, the not so-called non-genomic uh, type of effects. iPhone yeah. 4, number two things. One, if you identify <laughs> yourself, you'll get credit for attendance <laughs> at, because we don't know who you are. <laughs> But please unmute um, yourself and, oh, Gabe, okay, Contreras, okay, Dr. Contreras. Fine. Yeah, in, in a young adult man with a LDL cholesterol more than 60 and, you know, a negative genotype, can we obtain from your models, what is the actual, you know, coronary heart disease event rate? And what would be the absolute yeah. risk reduction and number needed to treat if you start yeah. them on starting early compared to late or to controls that only follow uh, you know, lifestyle modifications. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for yeah. that question. I, I admit to weakness, I can't tell you the numbers right now, <laughs> but I can give you, I can give you some context. Um, if you look at the paper uh, you see on the slide, Kieran Holy Lynch, um, I can take my slides down if I can find them, um, find that. Um, but in his paper, um, there's one that he has on uh, treating young adults with high cholesterol. And there's another one looking at borderline cardiovascular risk with high cholesterol. And, and so the, the current formulas for the ASCC, AHA um, pool risk equations that we use to determine who should be treated highly, highly determined by age. And, and um, so I, I've, countless times talked with residents in clinic who have a, a young adult patient or a you know, middle-aged patient with an LDL cholesterol of 180, 185, even 190. And they, calc they use their risk calculator and like, 
nope, they don't qualify. Their ASC, 10-year ASCD risk is, is 5%. I'm like, this person, <laughs> if you don't treat them, they're going to have an MI, maybe not in 10 years, but in 15 years. So, so absolutely, um, if you look at those papers, you'll see that there, there are um, young adults with very high cholesterol, greater than or equal to 160, their equivalent, their risk equivalent is similar to an older adult in their 70s with a beautiful LDL like 80. So, so um, those two have the same 10 year risk. So, so um, there are definitely people who are um, indicated for treatment under current guidelines who probably derive less benefit from lipid lowering than those who are not included. And there, no. there are papers published on that as well. <laughs> no, that, that, that I got it, but it's relative yeah. risk. My, my question is, is the absolute risk different you know, than merit you know, to expand, for example, the pool cohort equation down to the age of 20? Right, right. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, you're not supposed to use those equations. And I think you're, you're asking about that, but my um, colleague, E, who's also listening to this trial, uh, slide, she's been working with a colleague. Um, the two of them are the, the wonder twins because they, they seem to get every R01 that they apply for. But, they, but they've been, she, E, e uses these, um, these NIH cohorts I showed you, but her colleague, Jay Jen, who's at Kaiser Permanente Southern California, they use this massive Kaiser Permanente data set. And so they're actually able to, you'll, you can look, I can maybe send um, estimating pool risk equations for young adults because they have enough data to do that. And they also have enough data to look at ethnic groups that are not included in these cohorts I showed you. So I want thank to thank, th thank Dr. Moran. We're at the top of the hour and uh, very much want to thank everyone's participation and especially you, Dr. Moran. Thank you for visiting with us last week and providing these excellent grand rounds this week. I, re I refer everyone to the chat in order to identify the link for the MOC and CME credits that are uh, due to you. So thanks so much, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you this evening at the State of the Department address here in the CRB.